the moment you get caught with the reading, with the bug of reading and learning, and you get addicted to it, you have to know that your mind is going to process stuff and the debate starts happening here and it's forever. It never stops. He said, you lose a little bit of happiness when you go too much about wanting to get certain questions answered in life because it's never going to end. It's forever. He said, so if you choose to subscribe to wanting to become a lifelong learner, be also ready to lose a part of that happiness and freedom that you once had when you didn't know everything. Now, you and I may say, I wouldn't want to live that life. I mean, what are you talking about? I don't want to be controlled by other people. I don't want to be naive where I just look at the media. Oh, okay, vote this way. Okay, okay, do this way. Oh, they're the bad people. Oh, you're right. They're the bad people. I don't want to be that person. But there's a part of it where you're like, you know, is that the life kind of I want to live? Am I going to miss the freedom, the special small things that used to make me be happy? Now I can't even enjoy the small stuff that I used to. Do you ever catch yourself asking, oh, man, maybe I'm in too deep of being this worried genius and I've lost a bit of my oh, yes. happy, simpleton. Yeah, well, I certainly experienced that when my health broke down. And the reason for that was that I, I not only did I get sick, my life fell apart because I couldn't do anything that I used to be able to do. I couldn't listen to music. I couldn't read. I couldn't write. I couldn't think. I, I, I couldn't do any of them because everything that I had done was really was um, complex and difficult. All the things that I engaged in. And what I did realize was that that left me vulnerable on a certain front, because if I lost my, if I wasn't at in peak, peak health, let's say, I wouldn't be able to do those things. And so, I mean, that's why I'm walking now, for example, you know, I said I walk six miles a day and I do that every day. And it's very simple. And I have played a lot of ping pong and I've always liked that, but I never played that much, but I like that. And um, there, there is some utility in having things around that are rewarding and, and good for you that are less complex. Um, I would say though, that with regards to the conflict between let's say, you know, miserable wisdom and happy ignorance is that there's, there's different forms of rewards to be found in different places. You know, you can think about this even in terms of personality. One major personality dimension is extroversion. And the reason for that is that we have a, a pleasure circuit and, how active that is varies between people. That's what causes variation in extroversion. And we generally equate happiness with the activation of the circuitry that's associated with extroversion. And drugs like cocaine and amphetamines activate that circuit. But there's another personality dimension, which is openness. And openness is the creativity dimension. And there's pleasure to be derived from that as well. And that, so that's philosophical exploration and, and literary experience. And I suppose when you go to a movie, you, you experience a blend of those two things, especially if it's a rather complex movie. So there's different forms of engagement or pleasure to be found. And some of them are more akin to happiness and some of them are more akin to, to meaning. And sometimes they come into conflict, but, but I think all things considered, they, they work best when they're, when they're working together. And I, I do strive diligently to, and I think that this has really been brought home to me. You know, look, I couldn't sit down. I literally couldn't sit down for almost a year. And I, so I lost the ability to sit down. I had fantasies for hours of being able to sit by a fireplace and just not move because I had this condition called akathisia, which is... I learned how, how valuable it is to be able to sit down. And now when I sit down and nothing is happening... I, I'm taking stock of that and noticing what an un unbelievable gift that is. And it is really useful to maintain your ability to see what you have that you've taken for granted, because you can lose, you can lose everything. You can lose things you don't even know you have. I had no idea that you could ever lose the ability just to sit down, but you can. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. So I'm more appreciative, I would say, of of simpler things than I was. I'm more appreciative of other people than I was. Um, I'm probably more grateful, all things considered, than I was. Um, and hopefully that will continue developing. I, I have no contempt for happiness. You know, I, I tell people, don't pursue happiness, pursue meaning. 
And I think that's true. But if happiness comes along, it should be welcomed. And if you're ever somewhere where that's happening, you should notice it and, and be grateful for it and enjoy it. And that's for sure. Yeah. Do, do you think sometimes uh, the world sets an expectation of who you are and you constant compliments? Oh, my gosh, Jordan, let me tell you, you changed my life. Oh, my gosh, Jordan, you don't even know what your book did to me. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, you have no idea. Because of you, I'm doing that. Because of you, my marriage work. Because of you, I have better relation with my dad. Because of you, I'm doing better with my mom. Because of you, because of you, because of you. Sometimes that because of you, it's a little too much burden of because of you. It's like, dude, because of me, don't do shit. Like, because of me, just let me be free for once. Like, because of you, like, maybe I don't want you to say because of you. Let, go, go live your life. Let you Because of you, you made the decision. I'm just writing a book. Do you ever feel like you don't want that standard and expectation of, you know, putting you on the pedestal here and then you have to almost walk on water where you're not free. Do you ever feel that kind of an obligation or no, that's not even something that crosses your mind. I feel that obligation all the time. Got it. And I, I have people around right from the beginning of all this. I've, I've talked to my friends and my family all the time about what I'm doing so that I don't make a mistake, you know, so that we're trying to stop me from making a mistake. So, but I also, especially when I'm talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, I don't want See, if you're a clinical psychologist, you don't want to steal people's um, accomplishments from them, which is partly why you don't you don't give advice exactly. So maybe someone is trying to decide whether they should get married, and maybe you have an opinion, but probably you shouldn't, because as a psychologist, let's say, because except perhaps in extreme cases, um, the person has to discover that what they need to do for themselves so that they can discover it again in the future so that they can learn to discover things for themselves. And you don't want to give advice because then if they do something good, you can take credit for it. And I, I don't want to take credit for, for um, the accomplishments that people make as a consequence of, um, what would you say, putting the ideas they encounter in my books into practice. They put them into practice and good for them. And so when I meet people in the street, that's what I tell them. You know, it's like, okay, you did this, this specific thing, good for you. And, you know, I provided some impetus and I'm happy about that and pleased to, to do that. But I certainly don't want the credit. And, but I certainly, I do feel the obligation. I think it is part of what made me ill. Uh, I think it is because, you know, as a psychologist, I dealt with people's innermost secrets for decades and but it was kind of limited right it was 13 people or so a week maybe up to 20 which is still quite a few people but it's not it's not an inordinate number of people it's a bounded number of people and and then i had my other work that i could escape into let's say and and i wasn't carrying it with me the burden of 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 the lives of the people that i was intertwined with but then all of a sudden i started to experience that the the longing i suppose in some sense on a much greater scale and that that's been difficult to digest the misery and and, and that, that that's so common in people's lives and but even worse than that the the degree to which it requires almost nothing to rectify it in an important way you know people there's many, many people who are starving for a word of encouragement. And if you provide that, it, they, they run with it. And, but that, and that's great, but it also reveals this, this terrible, unnecessary lack. It's like, well, why weren't they encouraged to begin with? You know, it, it, and, and that's a deep hole to fall down. And, you know, because you can never stop answering that question once you start asking it. And, you know, it has something to do with, with the fundamental difficulty that everyone who's human has in valuing their own existence because of its imperfections and and finitude and it's a very complex question and then to see that played out thousands of times these brief encounters i have with people they're very intense you know people tell me things in those encounters that they don't tell anyone else or, or they tell very few people or maybe they've never told anyone in their life. And I can see too, this young man stopped me on the street the other day and he was, he was looking a bit beat up. And he came up and he said, he was very shy and he said, 
well, you, you know, your lectures have been very helpful. And I said, I asked him what his name was, and that usually helps people set, set them at ease. And then I said, well, what, what helped you? And he's, he, he was quite hesitant. He didn't exactly know how to formulate what he was doing, but I could see that he was very scared to say anything that he had done well, because his experience had been that he'd never been encouraged when he did something well. And so, you know, you can really punish someone if they come up to you and say they did something good that was actually good, and then you punish them or ignore them. It really hurts them. And that happens to children all the time. And it certainly had happened to this young man. So he's very hesitant to tell me what he had done that was good. And, you know, he told me and I listened and I said, look, this is as far as I'm concerned that what you did was really good. And he just lit up, you know, it was, and that's great that he lit up, but it's terrible that that it hadn't happened to him before. So if you like this little short clip from an interview I did, click over here to watch the entire interview. And please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.